from downtown Decatur, it's the Faber Files. Hello, I'm your host, Bill Faber. Because democracy demands debate, we present this program of public issues and interests. Nowhere else on broadcast TV do you see extended interviews about people and places that affect our community and our lives. Tonight's special guest is Bill Fletcher, Jr. He's a Harvard graduate and a union activist. An author, author of the renowned book called Solidarity Divided, A History of the Labor Movement in the United States. We do a short interview here with Bill Fletcher in which he expounds on his views uh, and analyzing our society, the place of workers, and the future of America. You know, you will find that Bill Fletcher presents a little bit different point of view than you hear on broadcast TV, radio, or newspaper. You know, in the horse world, as many of you know, that my hobby is riding and training horses. A generation or two ago, horsemen used to break horses. Today, they gentle horses. There's been a revolution in the horse world on how to train and teach and relate to horses. When that revolution first began, the old generation thought that the young guys were crazy that horses could not be treated that way, that they needed to be treated with cruelty and hardness to make them obey. But the young guys figured out a new way, a gentle way, a way to have a relationship with the horse and the animal, and to make the horse sure and more confident and a better partner. Well, you'll see as Bill Fletcher presents his ana analysis this evening, that Bill Fletcher is presenting a different way, a different approach to the relationship of workers to the workplace the relationship of the worker to the boss, the relationship of the worker to the community, and the community to the worker. So thanks for watching this evening. I think you'll find Bill Fletcher fascinating. We're here with Bill Fletcher at the uh, Public, Public Affairs Center in the University of Illinois in Springfield. Uh, Bill Fletcher, Jr., welcome to Central Illinois. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we're th just thrilled to have you here to speak before the uh, the Mother Jones dinner this evening, and uh, one of your famous books is Solidarity Divided. Solidarity Divided. Uh, Decatur is a working man's town and a union town. We went through the war zone and the struggles of the 90s. Could you speak to that issue, uh, Bill, about what a community like ours can do to help regrow the labor movement? Communities all over the country. Uh, are being whacked by corporate America. Uh, workers that, workers in communities that dedicated themselves to hard work, to, uh, to building themselves up, have been deserted by business. Uh, or they have been outright just attacked, uh, you know, uh, attempts to destroy unions attempts to destroy the public sector and it's created a climate of both resistance and despair uh, so part of what I would say to you is that what communities need to do is rethink the fight for economic justice I'll give you an example of what I mean um, We've been told for years that we should rely on private capital to invest, to rebuild our communities. But what we're seeing all over this country is that there are entire regions that are being deserted by private capital. There are cities in this state, this great state, East St. Louis, for example, that's been deserted by private capital. Uh, I, I mean, the list just goes on and on. When you say private capital, you were talking about business? Yeah, business. Mm -hmm. uh, so, our communities need to rethink economic development in a very fundamental way. One of the things that we really need to pay attention to is starting to create industrial co-ops. Worker co-ops. Co-ops. That's right where workers come together, invest, and start creating businesses. Uh, we can't rely on convincing private investors to come into our uh, towns and cities uh, and create businesses. 
because there's areas that they're not interested in. But unless we're planning on abandoning areas wholesale, we have to start thinking about how do we redevelop our communities. So one of my answers to you is that we have to start thinking about economic development in a different way. A second thing is that we have to challenge the laws uh, of this country that make it very difficult for workers to organize unions, uh, for workers to engage in real collective bargaining, uh, for workers to have anything close to a level playing field with big business. Uh, we have to challenge that. And at the state level, uh, one of the things I think that we have to do is we have to really look at this issue that was made very uh, popular by the Occupy movement, which is this great polarization of wealth. You know, one of the things that someone was telling me uh, on the way in here uh, was that there was just this big giveaway of, what, $85 million to, uh, to big business. And then, at the same time, to add insult to injury, workers are then told that now there's a budget problem and they're the ones that have to pay the price. Well, part of what that says to me is that we need different political representatives and we need different laws. We really need to start challenging the way that wealth is divided in this country. I mean, we have people screaming because they're living paycheck to paycheck. They're uh, uh, losing the ability to have a pension. My parents were able to retire. They had good union jobs. They were able to retire and, and have good pensions, respectable pensions. I know of almost no one of my generation that faces that prospect. Most people I know, my age and younger, are basically making the assumption that they're going to have to work until they drop. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So we need to have a program that we're demanding that changes the laws that, I mean, one of the things that we need in this country are portable pensions. We need to have the ability, let me put it in a different way. If you're lucky enough to have a pension, the problem is if you leave that particular employer, you're leaving that pension. You may go to another employer that maybe has a pension, but more than likely doesn't. And you're just stuck. We need to have laws in this country that allow workers to carry their pensions with them, to build up over their lifetime a reasonable pension that helps them survive. We're not supposed to be working until we drop. So I think that what this is calling for is in fact a movement for economic justice, a real movement. This is not just about unions. It's about anyone that is sick and tired of economic injustice getting together and demanding uh, a different deal from corporate America and a different deal from government. You know, when you talk about empowering workers to have co-ops, when Firestone left Decatur, mm -hmm. They had, the men had all the knowledge, all the skills, the labor, uh, the building, all's there, and the thought never occurred, never occurred to the labor leaders to develop a co-op and make it go without the capital people. Right. And that's true across the country. Why is that? It's an interesting question. It's a historical question. It goes back to about a hundred, more than a hundred years that when the American Federation of Labor was formed, there was a rejection of the idea of worker cooperatives. The thinking of Samuel Gompers, the founder of the AFL, and his uh, group was that, that that was not the role of labor. That labor was simply, uh, labor unions were simply about fighting for wages, hours, and working conditions, and that the employers, the employer class, are supposed to provide jobs. Uh, so the idea of co-ops, which goes back well into the early 19th century, was essentially abandoned. Now, there have been co-ops ever since, and they're re-emerging. The United Steelworkers of America uh, 
within the last few years, engage in a partnership with the Mondragon cooperatives in uh, northern Spain, in the Basque region of Spain. And the Mondragon cooperatives are the world's most successful cooperatives. Uh, they started in the 1950s. So the steelworkers want to look at that model and figure out what could be done like that here in the United States. I think that that's fantastic. That's exactly what needs to happen. So that's one of the reasons that the union movement essentially abandoned the idea. The other problem that emerges is that in order to get many of these cooperatives off the ground, you need startup capital. And it's not just lying around. And that's where the role of government could be very, very important, where you could have cities or counties or states providing the necessary startup capital, basic research to help these companies get off the ground. And it's in the interest of government because once you get these companies off the ground, you have a new tax base. Sure, but the corporate kings don't want that. They don't want that, that's right, which is why this is a political fight. This really is. It's a fight over two different visions of the future. One vision that says that the economy should serve the workers, and the other that says that the workers should serve the rich. It's really, it's that stark. You know, I see brave men and women who go, they'll go to Afghanistan and put their life on the line to stand up uh, for their country, mm -hmm. and yet they won't stand up to the boss. Uh, yeah, that's pretty ironic and paradoxical. Um, here's what I would say. We live in a very hierarchical country, and hierarchy is often hidden by myth. You know, we're told that Europe had these feudal hierarchies and everything, and that here in the United States there were no hierarchies and sort of anyone could go anywhere. And that's simply a myth. Hmm. The hierarchies exist in a number of different ways in this country. And one of the things is inherited wealth. Uh, the second is that upward mobility is overstated. The mobility of most workers is horizontal rather than vertical. But the other thing is that the workplace is totalitarian. A little fact that few people want to discuss. I mean, just think about it. When you go to work, you basically lose your constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. You don't have freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. You don't have freedom of the press. Mm -hmm. You don't really have freedom of association, right. unless you have a union. Mm -hmm. um, you lose all of those rights, and, the, and the, your future is entirely in the hands of your employer. But then you add on to that that if you choose to organize collectively, although we technically have a right to organize, the way that the, because the law did not keep pace with changes, what has happened is that it is often in the interest of the employers to break the law because the penalties are so weak. Mm -hmm. One of the big changes that has to take place at the, at the level of uh, statute is that there needs to be punitive damages to employers who infringe on a worker's right to organize. Right now, if a worker is fired for organizing a union, the most that they can get are back wages and benefits, assuming that they looked for a job while they were out of work. So there's no punitive damages. So an employer can just say, it's worth it to me to pay the back wages if what I can do is chill any effort at organization. So what happens is that a lot of workers are afraid. Um, my father used to say when I was growing up that in this country, political opponents are more often than not starved to death rather than shot. And it's a very profound comment. Very profound. You know, um, people get blacklisted. People uh, find it impossible to find work. Uh, and th this follows them. 
And now with, uh, with the development of computer technology and the internet, it's much harder even, I mean, once upon a time, if you were blacklisted, you might move to another state, reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. Now it's almost impossible. And so all of this creates a fear, which is why when workers organize, they need the support of their communities. They need to know that it's not just them that are fighting in their workplace, but that the community is really backing them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really interesting how the, uh, the working force will accept this totalitarianism in the workplace because they really know no other alternative. No, they're not educated to an alternative, they're not offered one. They think, right. they don't realize one might, might exist. That's right, absolutely. And, and I would say that uh, part of that is our fault. Mm -hmm. That is the fault of the union movement. Mm -hmm. I think that we've done an abysmal job mm -hmm. at education. And as I'm going to be discussing tonight, in the 1940s, the bulk of the labor movement abandoned the notion of unions as an instrument for a broader movement Check. of economic justice. Mm -hmm. And that was fateful. We're living Check. the results of that abandonment now. Yes, yes. Is there any hope that the labor leaders will um, make an about Check face? One. Check one. There's a there's a lot of hope, which is why I keep going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I, as I like to say, if I had no hope, I'd become an entertainment lawyer. Um, so, uh, check one, check one. No, I think there's a lot of hope. I, part of what I, I, I sense is that out there, there's a lot that's percolating. Mm -hmm. uh, in this state, you had 2008, 2009, the... Uh, take over public windows and doors. You had just more recently the Chicago teachers strike. Um, both examples of courage and creativity yeah. showing that a different path can be followed. We've had uh, the experience in Wisconsin the, of the, uh, the response to Walker, the, uh, the movement in Madison, which no one expected. We've had the Occupy movement. So the way I look at it is that beneath the surface, there is something absolutely percolating. Mm -hmm. Now the question is this, will it evaporate like steam, or will it turn into lava? Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that it turns into lava. You know, we've had too many experiences where, the, you know, it feels like you're right on the verge of something, and then it just disappears. What we need is something to gel, and that's why we need a certain quality in labor leaders that too few of them exhibit. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I like to tell this story because it struck me. Years ago, I was watching the HBO series Band of Brothers, about the 101st day of one division one of the most incredible video film experiences I've ever seen. In Band of Brothers, these replacements in the second or third episode are coming up to the front, and they run into this veteran. He was either a non-com or a lieutenant, I can't remember. And the veteran says to them, you're nervous, aren't you? And they said, yeah. And he said, that's because you don't realize you're already dead. And he said, as long as you think you're alive, you're not going to be able to fight the Germans. It's when you realize you're dead that you can fight them. Now, when I watched this, I said, wow, my God, what are you telling them? And then it sunk in, what he was uh -huh. saying. What he was saying was this. When you are in battle, if your main preoccupation is staying safe, you can't fight your enemy. There was going to be ducking. Mm -hmm. looking for the foxholes, right? That if you, if you want to fight, you have to cease believing that you're going to survive. In our movement, we have too many labor leaders that think that they're still alive mm -hmm. and don't realize we're dead. That's a great metaphor. You know, uh, Mr. Fletcher, in my law firm, we have uh, several generations. 
you know, what I've noticed about the younger generation, the kids, 20-something, that, that um, they have a different attitude, and they're almost at the point, I'm feeling, sensing this, of being just fed up, and something, they don't know what, but right. something different's got to happen. That's right. They're being dumped on by the society. Not just, so, everyone after the baby boomers has been dumped on by the rich. Mm. The, uh, the, the Generation X basically grew up in economic crises. At every key moment in their life, there was an economic crisis. The millennials are coming up, and they have almost no hope that they'll have a pension. Uh, they're worried about the environment. And they're watching this wet, this, this uh, scissors economy where the polarization of wealth is just becoming more and more extreme. And the challenge is for us in the union to be able to speak for and with these generations. Now, in order to do that, we have to change. We have to change in some very dramatic ways. One of the, one of the problems that we have is, and it relates to the, the metaphor, is that you have leaders that are frequently more concerned about their next re-election more concerned about their relationship with the boss than they are with rolling up their sleeves and getting in the trench. Um, you have too many union leaders who are afraid that if they are truly rabble-rousers, that they will be treated as disreputable. And they've forgotten the way this movement started. Mother Jones did not become who she was by begging. She didn't go to the capitalists and ask them to treat workers better. Uh, she was outrageous. She was audacious. And that's what we need. And, and I think that when younger people see that, they're gonna, they'll be inspired. Sure. But the other thing that needs to happen is that the union movement needs to be open to young people. And that means that we need to change the way that we do things. I mean, how often do we say to younger people, in so many words, that's not the way we do it here? Well, one thing I'll tell you is this. As a baby boomer, when older people would say that, when I was in my 20s, our attitude was, okay, let's seize the stage, right, and drive them out. Mm -hmm. Younger people these days, don't say that. Mm -hmm. They say adios. Mm -hmm. Not even hasta la vista, right. they say adios. Mm -hmm. It's like, and then you're, they're gone. They're gone. And, and so we have to have a movement that welcomes in young people. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that everything young people do is right. right. I, that's not my point. Right. It's that we've got to understand that they have a different way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about the possibility. Yes, yes. There's a good group coming up. There's a great group coming yeah, up. Yeah, a great group coming. We've got to believe in them. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. I they see. just need the weaponry. They need the weaponry. Uh, if I may offer this observation, I, I would think that our generation, which has so failed those behind us, that right now that our greatest task is to help educate them, to show them alternatives and possibilities that they can consider. I would agree. I, I would agree with the second part. I, I'm not ready to say that we failed those that came behind us. Um, I'm really proud of my generation. I mean, my generation is a generation of the 60s and 70s, the generation that fought in the streets of Birmingham, that organized workers in the fields in California, uh, that introduced the environmental movement, the new environmental movement. I, I think we have an amazing amount to be proud of. I think the problem is that at a certain key moment, particularly in the 1970s, we dropped the ball. Mm -hmm. And that we ceased realizing that in this kind of economy that we live in, we're walking eternally 
until this economy changes, up a descending escalator. You know, I used to always, I always tell the story about when uh, my daughter was very young. I would get on a descending escalator and I'd walk up and my daughter would just, oh, she just thought it was so funny to watch daddy trying to go up the... Well, when you walk up a descending escalator, one of the things that you realize is that, A, you can't stand still. If you stand still, you end at the bottom. That you have to walk faster than the escalator is descending. We forgot that. We thought at a certain point we could stand still. A lot of wisdom there. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Bill Last night, as I... My question.